The Intertech Group and the Zucker family are proud to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. Welcome to We the Women. This is our celebration of the 19th Amendment. Exactly 100 years ago, on August 18, 1920, the 19th Amendment was ratified giving women the right to vote. To celebrate, we'll be talking to women from around South Carolina, thought leaders, movers and shakers. We'll ask them about how they have used their voice and what they have done to contribute to our great democracy. Enjoy the conversation. Today I am joined with Dr. Mary Thornley, who's longtime president of Trident Tech. Thank you so much for um, Hello. the time to be here with me today. My pleasure. My pleasure. Um, I wanted to open it up. Um, the reason that we're here is kind of to reflect on the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote. Um, as a longtime education advocate and as an influential leader in the Charleston area, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on what that anniversary means to you. Well, I have to be very honest with you. I'm the beneficiary of the right to vote without having been a very strong student of what that meant. It turns out that last winter, my daughter, Nicole, asked me to join her at Duke University for a women's conference, and center stage in that conference was the 19th Amendment. So let me just mention to you a few facts that I learned from that, because I didn't know this. But to remove the word male out of the Constitution took 52 years of continuous campaigns. And what I'm going to read to you, these are facts written by Carrie Chapman Catt, who was the founder of the uh, League of Women Voters. They conducted 56 campaigns of referenda to male voters, 480 campaigns to get legislators to submit suffrage amendments to votes, 47 campaigns to get women's suffrage written into state constitutions, 277 campaigns to get party conventions to include women's suffrage planks and party platforms, and 19 campaigns with 19 successive Congresses. I had no idea. All of that to get this to happen in August of 1920. And when I reflect on that, my mother was born in 1922, so she's always been able to vote. Her grandmother, or her mother, would have been alive when the right to vote occurred. And I'm sure she never voted. She lived to be 101, but she couldn't read or write one word. She didn't even know how to make an X for her signature. All that does is remind me so much how far we've come and how much this right to vote for about a half of our population can really matter. I'm not gonna take this for granted anymore. None of us should take this for granted. We should not take any American right we have for granted because somebody, some bodies, spent basically the best parts of their lives enabling us to have that right. My mother would never miss a chance to vote. She's 98. I've never missed a chance to vote. Wow. I didn't know some of those things as well. That's, that's actually enlightening to hear. It's amazing. How much work it really did take to get to that, that point. Um, and of course, you know, I, I was speaking with um, other people uh, through this project and I think it's important when we talk about it too, that while it did guarantee, you know, the right to vote for women, Women of color obviously had a lot of obstacles long after that to securing their rights as well. So I think that's especially interesting when we talk about what's going on today in you know, national conversations. Yes, because every vote that has brought about more inclusion has paved the way for every future vote to bring about more inclusion. Absolutely. I think um, when I was in high school, you say that you never missed an opportunity to vote, which I think is a really powerful thing and sadly maybe a rare thing. I'm not sure, you know, if, if everyone feels as strongly as you do about making sure you never miss those opportunities. But I took, uh, I volunteered to work 
election days. So I kind of saw the behind the scenes aspect of it, which I think is really an yes. cool experience for a high schooler to have. Um, my grandchildren are 18 and 19 this year. Mm -hmm. So for my grandson, it's the first time he can vote. He will. My granddaughter, they're excited about voting. That's what you need, people to understand. They, they have something to invest in this. Voting is a right. Mm -hmm. It's a right that has to be used or it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well said. Um, I think when we have these conversations as well, not only is it we're talking about the right to vote, but we're also talking about, um, you know, the, the challenges and obstacles that women have faced over the years, um, especially those who go on to become leaders and maybe the, the obstacles that they've encountered. Um, you once said in a previous interview that you weren't sure the, the role that your gender played on your career and then on your track. I'm curious if you still um, feel the same way, if you think you're not sure because how would you know? Well, let me ask you this. If you were talking to General Walters or President Hsu or President David Cole, you would not ask him, them, what role do you think your gender has played in your leadership? You would not ask that. Yeah. Well, there's almost no point in asking a woman that because she has no answer. Mm -hmm. I used to think that what it did was to, that, that I lead an institution the same way I think I was mother of a family. I had two kids. I wasn't so interested in which child was right and which was wrong. I wanted a win-win because we were a family. They had to grow and go on. But as I look at the way my son behaves, he behaves the same way. So that's not a female trait necessarily. So I, I guess I do take for granted the fact that I'm a woman, I'm a nurturer, because I do know so many men who also are nurturers. Yeah. But let's say there are differences and let's say there are considerable differences. That's another reason why the right to vote is so important. We need to include everybody so that every voice has a say for anything that matters large or small in our country, anything that matters. I feel very strongly about that. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I'm curious, so, and that's very fair answers that you're right. When we look at um, presidents of, or leaders of colleges, it's, you know, it's increasingly rare maybe, maybe not so anymore, but to see a, a female uh, president. I mean, you're right, you wouldn't ask, uh, I wouldn't ask President Chu or, you know, any of those other leaders about their role. But I guess, let me rephrase it, let me ask. Okay. Do you think that you faced different obstacles than men, those men might have faced on their trajectory because of your gender? Or do you think you ever, people looked at you differently um, as a powerful woman because of that, if that makes sense? I, I, I'm sh Pop, probably, uh, probably. But first of all, I never set out to be a college president, never. My entire life, I have understood the value of an education. My entire life, I have understood that that's the gateway to opportunity. If you can have economic opportunity, other things can fall in place. Um, I grew up in a out just outside of Mill Village in Concord, North Carolina. I've already talked about my grandmother who couldn't read or write anything. My mother dropped out of school in the seventh grade. Not only am I the first person in our entire generation to get a high school, to get a college education, I'm the first to get a high school graduate education. That's mind boggling because once that happens to one person, it opens the door for everybody else in that family. My sons and daughter, my son and daughter are very well educated. My grandchildren would be well educated. If you open the door and get one educated, you've opened the door for all the successive offspring. It's very powerful. So no, I never set out to be a college president. I set out to be a teacher because teachers had changed my life. I can rattle off to you the names of every teacher I had from the first grade through the 12th and in college and I'm not very young, but I have a very clear memory because every one of them helped shape me and it was so very special and so important. So I knew I was going into education, but I saw myself in the classroom. It happened by accident that I became a president. In fact, I missed the classroom and had to get over the fact that I can affect more students with decisions I make 
outside the classroom than the 150th semester I had inside the classroom. It took me a year or so to get over what I had lost in giving up the classroom to realize that I had a bigger forum. I could, I could make things better for so many more students. Is, was there any defining moment for you or any event that really um, made you interested and made you passionate about school or getting an education or, or anything like that? Like that. As a child or an adult? Up to you, whatever you, stands out most to you. Well, the day I went to school, we didn't have kindergarten. We started with first grade. We never had a book in our house. I'd never read. My mother was on swing shift. She was never home. I took care of the other three kids. I was the oldest. So I was immediately intrigued with books. And I, I didn't think there was anything unusual about it, but by the time I was in the second grade, I was reading on a 12th grade level. My teachers saw that as very unusual, and they looked for enrichment opportunities because they saw something in me that my parents didn't have time to see. They were too busy surviving, and I didn't have a context to understand. But reading, the person who can read, they own the world. They own the world. They can see anything, they can do anything, because they can do it vicariously. That's true for anybody, not just me. But my early teachers just created pathways for me to have enrichments. And then when I moved to Charleston and went to work at Trident Tech, I didn't really know what a community college was. My old background had been in Mars Hill, uh, Chapel Hill, University of South Carolina, I, I didn't know what a community college was, but I certainly do now, and I learned it very quickly. The community college is that level playing field, available because it's open door, accessible because it's affordable, and yet amazing because it's high quality. And the job opportunities are enormous. And if someone wishes to go to a four-year college, but they can't get in right away, or they don't have the resources to go right away, they can transfer as a sophomore or junior and not skip a beat. So once I understood that world, I saw how valuable. That's the answer to the great American dream. I believe that with every fabric that I'm composed of, it is the answer to the American dream. And I've now been president for 30 years. If you ask me what I'm proudest of, it will be the fact that I immediately started working on Trident Technical College being a reflection of the diversity of the three counties that we serve. Whatever those demographics are, that's what sh Trident Tech student body should look like. That is exactly what is true today and has been true for 10, 15, 20 years mm -hmm. because we work to make that true. Mm -hmm. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you started as an adjunct and part-time um, professor in 1973, I think. Right. Okay. Um, and you're you're mostly teaching policemen. Um, <laughs> technical writing, is that right? And what was that experience like? But uh, it, it sounds like they still have a tender spot, I think. It, it absolutely. Was, it was abso police officers do. I started teaching, teaching at Trident Tech the year it became Trident Tech. Mm -hmm. It had been BCD, Berkeley, Charleston, Dorchester Technical Education Center. In 72, it merged with Palmer College, downtown Charleston. Together, they became Trade and Tech. I started teaching. I taught at night. My husband was teaching at the College of Charleston. In the day, I taught at night. He kept the kids. It so happened that my first years of teaching, there was a federal program called LEAP that incentivized police officers to go back and get an education. So it just so happened that my first classes in the evening, and I taught until 11, 10 at night, were largely police officers who were there, frankly, to get the money. But what they discovered was the value of being able to communicate. If you can communicate clearly, whether it's on your written report or whether it's before a judge or before somebody stopped to give a traffic ticket, year three steps ahead of the person who struggles with that. So those were fascinating years. I became very close to lots of police officers and detectives who were in my classes. And, and 
it was fun to see them, see how much richer their career could be once they were better communicators. Because I didn't just teach writing, I taught public speaking as well. Those were fun years, fun years. At that point, you said you never set out to become president of the college. At that point, could you have ever imagined that, that you would get no, to the point where you were No, today? no, not at all. What, what sent you, how did you, how did you make that progression from part-time teacher to where you are today and where you've been serving in this role for decades? I mean, how did that happen? <laughs> well, clearly I love the classroom and I love being around students. Um, that was, that was really meaningful. But when I went through a divorce, I realized that I had to earn more money than I was earning, earning in the classroom. I needed a doctorate. What I really wanted was a doctorate in speech pathology, but I couldn't do that because I had to support kids while I got the doctorate. So I figured out that I could commute to USC and I could get a doctorate in education. Um, when, you, when you get a doctorate in education at USC, you had to fill out this piece of paper and say, here's my ultimate career goal. I said mine was to be a vice president of academic affairs. I meant that at the time because I loved academics. Mm -hmm. I, over the course of seven years, seven years, I did get the doctor traipsing back and forth between two nights a week from Charleston to Columbia. I use that story with students because many of our students at Trident Tech are part-time and I remind them that the years are going to tick by anyway. During your most energetic years, yes, you can have a family, you can work, and you can go to school. And as that clock ticks, you can do like I did. At the end of seven years, you picked up a doctorate. I had two kids. I worked full time the whole time. So I never knew where that would lead. I just knew that I didn't, I'm in education now. I didn't want not having a doctorate to keep a door locked that I might want to open, but I really didn't know what door I might want to open. I, I could see myself as the Vice President of Academic Affairs somewhere forever. Um, I actually only held that job for one year. Mm -hmm. Then the President left suddenly and the board named me interim and then wound up letting me apply and I became president. Mm -hmm. All of it unplanned, but I've obviously been around a very long time, 30 years. Yeah. What, when you look back, um, is there something that you're most proud of, of, of a change that you invoked at the college or how it's grown in your tenure that, that you're most proud of? I, I think, I am very proud of the fact that I think the community understands the value of having a two-year community college that it owns. If you look at the wonderful College of Charleston, it has a niche. If you look at the Citadel, it's terrific. It has a niche. The Medical University definitely has a niche. And Charleston Southern, they have a niche. When you look at Trident Tech, it's hard to put us in a niche because we offer 160 programs at the associate degree level and everything from HVAC to nursing to college transfer to cosmetology to 29 health programs. What the community needs in terms of employment, we probably offer that degree or we can ramp up to offer that degree. And it's wonderful that data will show that our graduates, our graduates, both one year after graduation and five years after graduation are earning commendable salaries. In fact, when you look at, when Dew looked at in-state students, those who stayed in-state st in and compared one year out and five year out to two-year college graduates and senior college graduates, amazingly, the two-year college graduate earned more. So I'm, I'm very proud that the community, our larger community in the state, understands the value of having a rock-solid community.
Community College. You have companies like Volvo and Boeing here, probably because you've got a rock solid community college that can give them technicians at the level they need to hire. Mm -hmm. We've talked about this a lot, but you've had a really long and active career. Do you have, I mean, whenever we spoke, I think with the Post and Career a few years ago, after 45 years, you know, working at, at the college, you, you had no plans of slowing down. I'm, I'm curious where your head's at now. I know there's a lot of things going on in the world that it's probably very draining, but is your head still in the same place that you're not ready to slow down quite yet, or? Uh, my answer to that question is, no, I can't. Um, there's a great book. Duckworth has a book out called Grit. Grit. I think it might be on the bestseller list. And she says this pandemic we're going through now, for future generations, this pandemic is going to be at least a paragraph, probably a chapter. It's not going to be a sentence. These are historic times. I don't want to make a decision. I, I want to be totally focused on trade and tech and what it needs to do facing the biggest challenge of its lifetime. This is the biggest challenge of our collective lifetimes. So no, I'm not thinking about retirement today. That's fair. That's a good answer. What's, what's your mind when we look to the future, given all the uncertainties? Um, what is your hope? What are you hoping to achieve when you look at the college and the decisions that it has to make? Um, you know, relatively soon when you talk about kids coming back and beyond. Mm -hmm. What is your vision or what is your, your absolute hope? I've read an awful lot about people growing up with adversity because I wanted to understand it. In part, that's what I came from. In large measure, that's where our students come from. Here's what can happen. You grow up in a lot of adversity, it's either going to destroy you or it's going to make you resilient. Those are two very divergent pathways, okay? My interest is that you cannot avoid obstacles, barriers, all of that. So learn to cope with it so you come out the other side resilient. That, that's what I want for our students. That's what I want for our college. This is a time, a time for us collectively and individually to really look internally and ask, who are we, what are we made of, and what do we value? Do we value each other? Do we root for each other? These are times to be completely unselfish. So I think we can emerge from this. We're not doing a terrific job of it right now, but we can turn that around in a minute. We're setting an example for our children and how they ought to behave when they're faced with an incredible obstacle, like a world pandemic. None of us have lived through a world pandemic before. Most of us don't remember a thing or know a thing about the Spanish flu of 1918, and Ebola never really affected the U.S. So that the pandemics that we have had didn't affect us, didn't affect every single one of us like this one is. So there is something that every one of us can learn and that we can teach even a three-year-old child. Stepping back maybe for a broader picture, um, you know, tying us back to why we're here today um, to talk about the 19th Amendment, you know, you say you know, we recognize that we've come such a long way in the past 100 years. Do you, feel, do you still feel like we have a lot of room to move forward in terms of um, gender equality or in terms of education? I'm not sure which one you'd like to tackle, but do we still have a lot of room to grow when we look at our futures? I can't imagine you asking anybody that question and them not saying yes. I can't imagine not saying yes to that. Our country is the greatest country on earth because we embrace differences. I, and I didn't say we just tolerate them. We embrace them, we celebrate them. I, I guess I would tell you that the world I work in, 
the world I live in is so meaningful because it's a microcosm of what I wish the whole country was. Our student body does reflect the demographics of Berkeley, Charleston, and Dorchester counties. But our employee base is reflective as well. I am very proud of the fact that we've won every diversity and inclusion and equity award that is given locally, in our state, and nationally that community colleges are eligible for. I'm really proud of that. But I'm most proud of the fact that that's what the way we live. That is the way we live. The world can be, the world has to live that way. Every one of us, every single one of us has to be free to vote, has to be free to feel free wherever we are, wherever we are. You know, I can't, I can't stress that enough. None of us are free until all of us are free. You know, we were talking about the pandemic earlier. I'm an English major, English speech major, and I kept thinking, there's a quote from Hamlet that kept coming back to my mind. When sorrows come, they come not in single spies, but in battalions, but in battalions. Shakespeare wrote that, that's Hamlet. There was a pandemic going on during Shakespeare's time now, he wrote Hamlet at a different time, but he wrote King Lear during that pandemic. And I am mindful that Henry David Thoreau chose to go to the woods to socially distance himself so that he could be free to think his biggest thoughts. I remind myself that when I'm holed up in my house at 41 Ford Row on James Island, because I am a socially connected person like all of us. I want to be with people. But I remind myself, think about this as a time to be richly reflective, to think and write and be and produce in ways that you wouldn't do if you were pulled and tugged on by physically being in the workplace and answering all those pings that occur nonstop. We have to use every opportunity that this pandemic has forced upon us to be the very thoughtful, most thoughtful we can, to be the very best we can. When you look back um, and reflect on your own life and your own journey, um, are there any people that come to mind um, that shaped your trajectory or, and who you are today? I, you will find this ironic, and I, I wouldn't call them uh, maybe they weren't mentors, but they certainly shaped my life. The number one person that comes to mind is Bill Finn. Bill Finn is still alive. He was with Aston Johnson. He's been very active in Alliance work. Um, he and my husband were competitors in the felt business, and he was my go-to person. I am grateful to him, and he still serves on the Triton Technical College Foundation Board. Three other men played key roles in my early life as a president, and I'll mention two of them have a common denominator. Montez Martin was chair of the board when I was hired, and Alex Grimsley, former president of the Citadel, we know what a great president he was of the Citadel, but when he retired there, he went on to become a member of the State Board for Technical and Comprehensive Education and was on the search committee with Montez Martin that offered me the job as the first female president of, the of, of Triton Tech. Mm -hmm. So those two people, I was always interested in understanding and pleasing. And so I want to mention the names Montez Martin and Alex Grimsley. Um, and I'll mention one more name. I was late in life going back to get my doctorate. I had an advisor and a professor, Dr. Conrad Powell at University of South Carolina, who clearly set me on a trajectory and said, you can absolutely do anything you want to do, and served as a reference when I became president. There are people in our lives all along the way that are either mentors or are there at the moment to answer a question for us that that's a point of inflection. Those, those 
gentlemen have, those four gentlemen have mattered a lot in my life. Now, as to women, once I was named president, I thought, what in the world does a president do? I hadn't prepared to be one, didn't know I wanted to be one, and suddenly I'm one. Hoffman at Medical University, who was the dean of nursing, and Sue Summer Cress at this College of Charleston, they meant a great deal to me. Sue Summer Cress continues to mean a great deal to me and is very inspirational as she fought her battle with cancer. So I don't think it matters at what point you are in your career. There are people who we want to please by doing what we know they would think is the right thing, and there are others that are inspiring in the answers and suggestions they have in our lives. And that's not just for novice people. That's for us old farts all along the way of our career. Well, you've been a pleasure. Um, I think that was all that I kind of wanted to cover with you. I can't thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. You've been a pleasure too. Yes, 